Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're very pleased to bring you the latest in E4C's 2014 webinar series. Today's webinar was developed in collaboration with Mathilde Ewines from One Dollar Glasses, Tosh Skolnick from GRIT, and myself. My name is Caroline Wyman, and I will be moderating today's webinar. When I'm not doing this, I work with Siemens Stiftung, the foundation, where I'm a project manager for social ventures. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit more about today's webinar, Simple but Intelligent Solutions for People with Health Restrictions. Millions of people in developing countries face urgent needs in basic supply that can be met successfully uh, through appropriate technological solutions. These solutions provide the chance to level out acute deficits and also offer vast opportunities to engage in independent economic business activities and income generation. The Empowering People Network, Technologies for Basic Needs, aims to make promising solutions accessible and to further their implementation. This webinar will introduce the network's approach to making appropriate solutions um, accessible and we'll take a look at two project examples that effectively help people who live with health restrictions. Today I will be speaking alongside Mathilde Ewine, Business Development Manager at One Dollar Glasses, and Tish Skolnick, CEO and co-founder of GRIT. We thank you for joining us today. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to take a, um, a moment to recognize the coordinators of the E4C webinar series generally. Jana Aranda of ASME, Holly Schneider-Brown and Michael Mader and Steve Welch of uh, IEEE, who work on developing and delivering the webinar series. Thank you. If anybody out there has any questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact them via email um, on the address visible on the slide, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Before we move on, we thought it would be a good idea to remind you about Engineering for Change and who E4C is. E4C is a global community of over 770,000 people, such as engineers, technologists, representatives from NGOs, and social scientists who work together to solve humanitarian challenges faced by underserved communities around the world today, such as access to potable water, off-grid energy, effective healthcare, agriculture, sanitation, and others. You're invited to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership provides cost-free access to a growing inventory of field-tested solutions and related information from all the members of the E4C's coalition, including professional societies like ASME, IEEE, ASCE, AS, um, SWE, and ASHRAE, as well as academic supporters like MIT's um, D-Lab, international development agencies like USAID, Engineering uh, Without Borders, USA, and Practical Action. It also offers access to a passionate, engaged community working to make people's lives better all over the world. Registration is easy and it's free. Check out the website to learn more and sign up. The webinar you're participating in today is one installment of the Engineering for Change webinar series. This free, publicly available series of online seminars showcases the best practices and thinking of leaders in the field who bring innovative ideas and technology to bear on global development challenges. Information on upcoming installments in the series, as well as archived videos of past presentations, can be found on the E4C webinar webpage. E4C's next webinar uh, will be on January 21st at 11 a.m. EDT. The topic will be Climate Change Preparedness and Resilience. Visit the E4C webinars page for registration details. If you're already an E4C member, you'll also be receiving an invitation to the webinar directly. Now, a few housekeeping items just before we get started. On the screen you're now seeing, 
there are a number of different widgets on the dashboard at the bottom. The group chat is where you will interact with your fellow attendees and post any comments about the webinar. The Q&A widget allows you to submit any questions for the presenters. The help widget is for inquiries about any technical difficulties with resources on how to use the software and FAQs. Share This allows you to share the link of this webcast with your friends and colleagues through 13 popular social media sites, and the Twitter, uh, Twitter icon um, allows you to post directly to Twitter. And lastly, the survey icon allows you to take our survey at any time. I know this is a lot, so always feel free to hover over the icon for an explanation. So we do have quite a few people attending this seminar. Um, so let's see uh, where everybody is from. Using the group chat, please type in your location. Um, as I can already see, we do already have Bangladesh Online, Burkina Faso, Germany, Uganda, the USA, Nicaragua, and Sweden. So we look forward to seeing more of those. Um, during the webinar, you can use the group chat to type any remarks you may have and interact with your fellow attendees. Don't forget to use the Q&A window to type in your questions for the presenter. If you encounter any troubles viewing or hearing the webinar, you may want to try opening up Webcast Elite in a different browser. Also free, feel free to access the help widget for technical help. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one profes professional development hour, one PDH, for this session, please follow the instructions on the top of the webpage, engineeringforchange-webinars.org. Also, please do make sure you take a moment to fill out the, the short survey. Uh, your opinions are invaluable, of course, to the webinar series. Without your comments and suggestions, the webinar just wouldn't be uh, what it is today. So let me introduce um, today's presenters. I myself, apart from being the moderator, will be introducing to you the Siemens Stiftung and the Empowering People Network. I have been working in the area of basic needs and social entrepreneurship at the Siemens Stiftung since 2012. Together with the Empowering People Network team, I have set up the first Empowering People Award, and I'm currently in charge of project development in the area of social ventures in Africa and Latin America. One of my particular areas of interest is and has always been that of health and hygiene for consumers and communities. Um, our second presenter will be Mathilde Ewines. Mathilde joined the $1 glasses because she wanted to make a real difference in the field through this simple, efficient, and life-changing project. She's using her 10 years of experience in international development and resource mobilization to support and expand the ODG partner network. Mathilde is an agronomist by training and has been working for NGOs, bi- and multilateral agencies, as well as the private sector, coordinating the design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of field projects, most recently at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Our third presenter today is Tish Skolnik, the CEO and co-founder of GRIT, a social enterprise that created the Leveraged Freedom Chair, LFC, an all-terrain wheelchair for riders in developing countries. Tish graduated from the MIT in 2010 with an SB in Mechanical Engineering and a minor in Applied International Studies. At MIT, Tish became hooked on using her engineering skills for public service, and she nowadays puts these skills to use in East Africa, Haiti, and India, where the LFC was developed um, and tested. Now, in terms of timeline, I will spend a few minutes explaining to you our work at the Siemens Stiftung and the approach taken by the Empowering People Network in supporting appropriate technological solutions for development. Mathilde and Tish will then have about 12 minutes each to present the health solutions before we move on to a question and answer session of about 15 to 20 minutes. During the presentation, please feel free to already drop your questions into the Q&A widget. We will be reading them at the same time as we present and respond to them um, at the end of the webinar. So let me start with um, a short presentation of the Siemens Stiftung. 
Siemens Stiftung is the uh, operational foundation of the Siemens AG. Our headquarters are in Munich, Germany, but we support and run projects internationally with a focus on Europe, Africa, and Latin America. We operate in the fields of basic needs, education, and culture. To specify, Siemens Stiftung is committed to technical and entrepreneurial solutions that can reduce existential deficits in basic services and strengthen social structures. In the area of education, we are committed to high-quality science education that enables the opportunities offered by technological advances to be leveraged responsibly. In the area of culture, we want to open up space in which artists can actively help to shape their societies and make a contribution to a successful community life. As I said, in the area of basic needs and social entrepreneurship, our goal is to help eliminate existential deficits. We do this by identifying, promoting, and in some cases also running projects that have the potential to improve basic supply in developing countries. These projects that we aim to strengthen together with partners are always based on three principles, that is appropriate technology, entrepreneurial models, and training. These projects should also always have the potential to reach both a high social impact as well as financial sustainability. Now, in order to identify such projects, we launched the Empowering People Award in 2013. This award identified and gathered a whole range of intelligent and impactful technological solutions that have the potential to reach exactly these goals. Let me give you a brief insight into the results and also the benefits of the first Empowering People Award. The graph that you see on your left gives you an overview of the entries in the different award categories, such as food and agriculture, ICT, energy, water supply and wastewater treatment, waste and recycling, or health. In total, we identified over 800 solutions in around 90 countries of the world that are suitable and tailored to the conditions in developing and emerging countries. In the category health, we had about 160 participants to the award. The response rate was really huge. So, um, in fact, I can already reveal to you at this stage that we will therefore most probably launch a new award in 2015. So do keep your eyes open for that. So what are the benefits of the Empowering People Award? Of course, there's prize money to be won, but there's not only that. The, uh, most importantly, the winners benefit from the high visibility that they receive through the award. The idea is to, chain, uh, to share the solutions within the development world by different means. Uh, first of all, a catalog is created. Um, it is openly accessible for everybody and features the most efficient evaluated solutions. Secondly, we collaborate with other platforms in order to increase the products and the project's visibility worldwide. Thirdly, we offer intensified communication support through publications, social media, and online campaigns. The long-term benefits for the winners of the Empowering People Award are threefold. They receive the chance for networking, peer-to-peer -peer and with partners of the Siemens Stiftung. They receive individual advice and support for their organization. And they also receive opportunities for further qualification. But of course, not only the winners of the award can benefit through tailored support activities by Siemens Stiftung. All the other projects that have been evaluated as, um, as suitable and best practice models become part of the Empowering People Network. Out of the 800 proposed solutions to the award, 100 have been selected to date by technical and development experts and became part of the network. Now, within this network, People can participate um, in a range of activities and benefit from the following opportunities. Firstly, by being included in the network solution database, projects are not only made visible, but we also aim at creating a network of partners around the projects, both on the financial and the operative side, and to foster interaction. Next to this information and networking database, we also create opportunities for knowledge exchange and training. 
This happens not only online, but also offline. Offline, we for instance offer so-called empowering people on site, which are regional workshops with um, network members. They always focus on a specific topic of interest to the participating organizations and offer training for local employees of these organizations. On an international level, there are also the Empowering People workshops. The last one was held just two weeks ago in Mexico in the context of the Global Social Business Summit. And finally, um, we also back up our approach and methods by research work. We have a research network called Irene C, which provides us with a better understanding of the ecosystem of social businesses and of social investing. We also develop innovative tools and methods together with research institutions, such as, for example, the first self-assessment manual for social entrepreneurs, which is a practical tool for your own impact assessment and impact measurement. It will be published on our network online soon. So just to quickly summarize, let me distill some of the key elements that we believe in for promoting social entrepreneurs and promising technological solutions. Through the solutions database, as well as the online and offline workshops, we believe in the crucial power of visibility and connectivity. We aim at connecting partners, at dialogue between social entrepreneurs, inventors, international organizations, as well as investors. We believe in the value of South-South exchange, and at the same time, research for practice as well as qualification are equally crucial in making technological solutions more accessible and more widely used. Now, having given you just a brief overview of the Empowering People Network, um, I suggest that we move straight on to our first practice example, which is the $1 glasses, who are not only part of the Empowering People Network, but also won the first prize of the Empowering People Award. Thank you very much, Caroline. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I am Mathilde Vance, and I work for One Dollar Glasses. 150 million people. This is more than the entire population of Russia. And this is the number of people who need glasses but do not have access to them. This means that some or most of them see like this instead of seeing like this. This has global consequences. It means that children cannot study, they cannot go to school, people cannot work or care for their family. This also has a major economic impact. The estimated loss of income due to poor vision is 120 billion US dollar. This is approximately the amount of the international development aid every year. So I think we can all agree that this is a pretty big problem and this can have a, a simple solution. And this is the mission of One Dollar Glasses. What we want to do is to provide high quality glasses to all. We want the glasses to be affordable, locally produced, available widely, robust, and individually customized. So this is what we're, we're doing and what we hope to keep doing. So how does that work to have such glasses? Martin Hoffman, the founder of One Dollar Glasses, created innovative main manual machines that allow you to transform a simple wire of stainless steel into a glasses frame. And this is what you can see on this picture. You can see the machine at work. The machines don't need any electricity. They are easy to use. And after a training of around uh, one month and then exercising for another month, you are ready to, to produce your, your own glasses. So here you have, you have some of the picture of the machines. And here you have a bit more of the process. And so you can see the, the frame that is created. And you can change the color of the frame. You can change the color of the beads on the frame. And you can also change the color of the nose and the temples. So you can really create a really nice frame. At a, um, and people can choose the color that they like. And on the frame, it's really easy to click the lenses that are adapted to the vision of the client, meaning that you can basically adapt each pair of glasses uh, have different um, lenses on, for each of your eye, which is really important and not always available. So this is the production of the glasses, and here is the result. 
So as you can see, it fits as well on a young boy as on older people. The woman you can see down is 99 years old, and this was the, the first pair of glasses she ever owned. And she said she had never seen as well in her entire life. So what we are uh, and what we want to develop is inclusive businesses. What we want to do is to bring this new simple technology where it is the most needed. We want to empower local people to produce and sell the glasses. So we really want the process to happen in country, creating local sustainable businesses. We don't want to import the glasses. <laughs> and while doing that, we want to ensure inclusiveness. We want to make sure that women are part of the training. We want to make sure that uh, handicapped people can be part of the training. And we want also to make sure that we go really far from the town and in the remote area to reach as much as possible, the people who really need the glasses but never have access to them. So we're working with the poorest for the poorest. So now to explain you a little bit better how this works and, and what, what happened concretely when uh, one dollar glasses decide to engage in a country. So when we say when, when we arrive in a country, basically there are three main things that uh, we're looking at. First, at setting up an organization. It's not necessarily um, our own organization. Uh, usually we're partnering with people, so that's the setup of a local organization with a partner or not. There are the training of the production and the sales team, and so as I said, this takes um, around three to five months. It depends a little bit. You have two to three period of training, two weeks training, and the people train on doing the glasses. Uh, between these periods, it's really important that uh, the quality of the classes is really high. It's, uh, it's, it's something that is very important for one dollar glasses. It's not because um, they don't cost a lot of money, because the, the raw material to produce the glasses costs only one dollar. And, uh, and I will explain a bit later how they are sold. But they are made of material that is not really expensive, and it's not for that that they should be of low quality. So this is the training, and then we are trying to get all the government approval to make sure that it's legal and for us to, to work in the country and the government will actually help us with our projects. So when the organization is set up, the production and the sales are, approved, uh, are done and the ODG concept is approved by the government, then we can go ahead and start a first pilot of producing and selling the glasses. And when this works, we can then scale it up within the country through additional training that are done uh, by trainers coming from outside or even trainer in country, because each of the person that is trained by one dollar glasses needs to train other people so that um, we create a virtuous circle in country. So to give you a, a little bit more detail about how this works concretely in country, so there is the initial the initial investment that is linked to the training bring the machine to the country. The machine are loaned to the producer. Um, they, uh, they don't have to buy them. And so there is all this initial investment. And when the people are trained for the production and the sales, um, the, the processing can, can start. As I mentioned, the raw material to create the glasses is only $1. And this is why they're called the $1 glasses. Once the production is fine, um, the eye testing can, can happen. So usually to do the eye testing, we are partnering with op ophthalmologists and opticians in country so that they can do the, the testing themselves during campaigns that were organized with them. Sometimes uh, you really don't have enough optician in country ophthalmologists. Uh, so, so then when it's legal, the salespeople from the Wonder Glasses do the eye testing by themselves during the campaigns. It's uh, the case uh, in different country. So the sales, the price of the glasses when they are sold are approximately four to six US dollar, and this depends on the um, on the country because this price basically covers the the salary for the producer and the salary for the salesman, as well as some money to buy new raw material and continue the cycle and make it a sustainable cycle. What is really important here is we're really not looking at people making a lot of money, where we really want to keep the, the price of the glasses low. So this is, a, this, this is really a, an important part of, of the process. So here uh, you can have a better idea of how, how this works in, a, in the country. 
And so this is what's happening in the country and how does it relate to one dollar glasses in Germany because the project originated in Germany and the the headquarters is there. So as you can see on the right side of the screen, the ODG in country is what I, I explain to you. You usually have a country director as well as production and sales team that produce and sell the glasses. Wonderla Glass is Germany. For the moment, we have two staff members and over 50 volunteers, and it's growing every day. Uh, what we support is the initial investment uh, to start the project in country, what I mentioned earlier, as well as setting up the local organization in country, providing the trainings, providing the machines, engaging with partners. And um, so this is the initial step before ODG in country starts. So when ODG is com in country starts, then from Germany there is uh, the quality control the, that is really important for us. We need to make sure that all the glasses are really well done, and we control the prices as well. We want to make sure that nobody is going to sell the glasses for a higher price. That's what has been uh, decided. And, it, uh, and we also provide best practices. So... Um, so that's what ODG Germany uh, does. And uh, when the, the raw material is sold by ODG Germany to the different ODG in country, uh, and when, when this uh, raw material is, uh, is sold, there is a little fee that goes towards um, the functioning of uh, one of the glasses Germany, hopefully making it a sustainable system all around um, in, the, in the long run. So, so that's the system, and to make it work, we really need to rely on a lot of partners, and uh, I've seen that uh, you are all coming from a different background, so I hope that each of you can find themselves uh, in one of these boxes here and maybe uh, see how, how we can actually uh, better partner and make this, uh, this project go even further. So we rely a lot on governments for the initial implementation, like helping us to, uh, allowing us first to enter the country, and then they can be a great help to, uh, to help us actually distribute the glasses in country. We work very closely with the, the civil society, with the NGO that often hosts us, and uh, also the producer and the, the sales team are usually coming from, um, are coming from the civil society. We work closely also with the private sector, with the local opticians and ophthalmologists in country. Uh, they help us with, uh, with the eye screening and also with the distribution channels. Uh, we are starting collaboration uh, with different agencies of the UN. Or they are really good at uh, bringing people together and also uh, reaching a lot of people um, really fast. And finally, uh, we also rely a lot on investors because um, we are really setting business in country that are that are self sustainable but to in order to set up these businesses, we need some uh, some investors and some some philanthropic investors to help us actually be able to go in country and and make the entire system system work and so we need help to scale up and scale out. So as of uh, November 2014, we are we're active in nine different countries. This means that we uh, producer training and have happened in all these countries and sales training as well. And we have uh, starting selling the glasses in four of these countries already. And up to now, over the last few months, 4,000 glasses have been sold, proving really that the concept works. The machines are uh, usable in country. People uh, use them really well. They, they produce high quality glasses. And there is really a demand because we knew there was a need, but we didn't know if people were actually going to pay to get the glasses. And we see that actually people are really ready to pay to get the glasses. So this is where we are now. We know that the model is successfully tested, the, the production is feasible, people are ready to buy. But now what we really need to focus on is to improve the sales channel and also getting more philanthropic funds to replicate the model further within country and, and to other countries. So these are the, the two big focus uh, for us now. Um, so basically, um, that's a bit of a conclusion. What we do is uh, one dollar glass is support the poorest with the poorest as well as the health system. It creates new sustainable jobs 
um, for the people who actually produce and sell the glasses, but also for the people who receive the glasses and can finally see and maybe get a job for themselves now that they can actually see much better. It brings people back into school and employment. And um, we will really love to, uh, as you've seen, we have a lot of volunteers and we're looking for for new partner to help us uh, to help us on the different um, aspects of the glasses, be it the, the production or the distribution channel. So we'll be really happy if you are excited by our project and you want to, to join us and discuss with us. So be a part of the solution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mathilde, for this very interesting presentation. Um, We'll have time for questions later. To all the attendees, please feel free to drop any questions you might have about the $1 glasses. Um, and I suggest we move on straight to Tish and the Leverage Freedom Chair. Hi, everybody. I'm Tish Skolnick, the CEO and co-founder of GRIT. Um, and our product is the Freedom Chair. Um, and I want to start off by introducing you to Ashok. Uh, we met him a few years ago um, in Jaipur in India and he had recently been climbing a tree and fallen out and sustained a spinal cord injury. And he was sent home from the hospital in the wheelchair you see him sitting in. It's a standard hospital style wheelchair, much like the ones you see to the right that are distributed by some large nonprofits. Um, now, while these seem like a good idea, they're really hard to push on the rough terrain in developing countries. They break easily and you can't fix them. The spare parts just aren't available in these countries, um, which, you know, leaves people like Ashok and the 20 million other people just like him around the developing world really stuck at home, uh, you know, unable to get to work or to school or to participate in their communities. So our team at MIT uh, decided to come up with a solution. Um, we looked at the ergonomics of, you know, really what could you uh, push with your upper body. We looked at the type of terrain that people had to travel on, um, everything from loose rocks and soil to steep grades. We looked at what parts were available and found that bicycle parts were really common and that a repair structure already existed for that. And we talked to users. We talked to hundreds of wheelchair users around the developing world to understand what their needs were, what their wants were, and really, you know, what they needed out of a product, uh, you know, like, like ours. And what we figured out was that you could really travel on this rough terrain if you could get more torque at the wheels. And we could do this using a lever. Um, we did a lot of research and testing and figured out that a lever between about 20 and 60 centimeters long allows you to get the maximum efficiency you want on smooth ground so you can travel really fast. It also gets you the peak power and the torque output you need to travel on really rough terrain. So we'll take a look at a video of it here in action. Um, so this is some footage from one of our users in India. Uh, and you'll see when he pushes forward on the levers, that pushes him forward. Now as he's gotten into this more challenging terrain, he'll slide his hands up the levers. The top of the levers, you get more torque at the wheels, and it's easier to power over those obstacles. In side-by-side -side testing, it's 80% faster than a regular wheelchair on smooth ground, and you can get 53% more peak torque at the wheels when you're climbing steep grades. And they've designed it so that it is functional and usable both outdoors and indoors, and by users of a variety of different ability levels. You can even do a wheelie. Now, we didn't just hit upon the perfect solution our first time around. Um, what you see now is the first prototype we built in 2008. Um, now, the levers worked really well, but we quickly found out that if you actually require a wheelchair, transferring into this is very difficult, being able to get yourself over that front wheel. And it was also quite unstable at high speeds. But the levers worked really well, and people liked the ability to travel on really rough terrain. So we went back to the drawing board, and back at MIT, we took our lever drivetrain and basically welded it onto an office chair just to get a first-order test of how the levers worked. And in that geometry, the overall performance was greatly improved. So we rounded out the rest of the elements, and we took the next prototype to East Africa in 2009 for an extended field trial in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, and started to get much more positive feedback. We still had a few things to work on, bringing the, the weight down and the width down. And in 2010, we worked with a partner in Guatemala, and we're getting even more positive feedback. 
So this is the Leverage Freedom Chair as it is today. Um, this is a show Koi introduced you to earlier in, the, in my talk, um, and here he is in a Leverage Freedom Chair. Uh, the very next day after he received his freedom chair, he went back into his village and he reopened a tailoring shop that he had been running prior to his accident. So the freedom chair, like I said, was designed by our team at MIT um, and is now uh, managed and marketed through a startup that we founded called Grit. Uh, field tested in seven countries, it features this patented lever drivetrain that we came up with, and we couple that with a rugged three-wheel frame, which makes it really great on rough terrain. And all of the moving parts are standard bicycle parts. So this means wherever you are, even if it's a remote village, somebody will be able to help you repair it and maintain it. We've shipped just over a thousand of them this year. We sell to mostly NGOs, foundations, aid agencies, um, folks like the Walkabout Foundation, the Red Cross, the World Bank. We manufacture them at our contract manufacturer, Pinnacle Industries in India and we've shipped to about a dozen countries this year. Now, while we were working on this and you know, getting the Leverage Freedom Chair out into the world, we started to hear from writers in the United States who said, it's really great you know, that you've come up with such a rugged, rough terrain chair, and we want to also be able to move beyond the pavement. We're stuck on sidewalks with cobblestones, and we want to go on the beach and be able to go in parks with our friends and family. And so we took a look at the landscape of the U.S. market and found that there are you know, daily wheelchairs that are great indoors on flat terrain, and there are some specific sports devices like hand cycles that people race in marathons. But these aren't very versatile. They're quite expensive, and they're very difficult to transport. They don't you know, fold or, or store in any sort of meaningful way. And there are 3 million wheelchair riders in the U.S. So we took... The freedom chair that we had originally come up with with the lever drivetrain and the three-wheel frame bike parts, and we've redesigned it based on feedback from wheelchair riders in the U.S. Uh, it's now <clears throat> easy to disassemble, so you can flat pack it for shipping, and you can also fold it to fit it in the trunk of a car. <clears throat> and we're using bike parts that are more commonly found in the U.S. We recently launched a Kickstarter, and we're a staff pick on the site. We've reached our funding goal, but we're trying to stretch it a bit further and would be happy, but we'd appreciate you checking out our page later. Um, so just a quick note about our team. Um, we all met uh, while studying mechanical engineering at MIT and then founded a startup shortly after graduation. We worked with a number of partners um, based you know, in Boston and as well as partners around the world who helped us get to, to where we are today. Now looking forward, we've got um, you know, Ashok on the left, who's riding our leverage freedom chair in, in India, and we've got Alan on the right, who's been testing our new freedom chair for the U.S. And our next steps are leveraging design similarities so we can merge production and distribution. The original leverage freedom chair is manufactured in India. Um, the new freedom chair for the U.S. market is currently being manufactured in the U.S., and we think there are a lot of opportunities to merge that and start to get even greater economies of scale so we can pass on savings to our customers. Over the past few years, we've, uh, we've had some successes and some challenges. Um, we've had a lot of success with our product design. Um, we've really used this user-centric design process to really understand what our customers want out of the product. Uh, we have a manufacturing line in India that operates at Steady State, and we've now got repeat customers who are coming back for second and third orders. Um, so all that is great, but we still have plenty of challenges. Um, you know, first and foremost, we have two different products in two different markets. And so from an operational uh, perspective and also from a sort of branding and messaging perspective, um, you know, we really have to be on top of a lot. Um, we're also managing a manufacturing operation overseas, which comes with its own host of challenges, and we're in the process of raising capital. Um, a lot of these things, you know, cost a lot of money, especially up front as you're getting manufacturing started, and uh, that's still still a challenge in this space. So I'd love for you guys to check out our website, um, the gogrid.us site right now, forwards to a Kickstarter page, which will be live until the end of this month. Um, and we'd love for you to check it out and give us any feedback you have, and you're also uh, welcome to reach out directly to me. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Tish. Thank you to you both for the really good presentation. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of questions. I would uh, like to open up the floor for question and answers right now. 
Um, to all the attendees, you can use the Q&A window, which is located right below the chat, uh, chat window, um, and type in your questions for the presenters here, and then we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, I see a few questions have already come in. Um, so there's um, a few questions about the Empowering People Network. I will maybe start with these. Um, Maria is asking us, could you please provide more information about the award? When will it be and how can my team take part? What are the main criteria? Um, well, as I said, uh, it is most probably going to happen um, uh, next year in 2005. Be careful when you – I've seen that some, some tweets have already gone out. So this is also indicative. Um, uh, it will most probably be launched in June 2015. Um, you can just wait until the call for applications is out, and there will be an online procedure to follow for your application. Um, now, in order to be one of the first to hear about the award, I would invite you to subscribe to our newsletter, uh, which is called the Empowering People Update. Um, to find that, you can just go on our webpage of the Empowering People Network, and there you click your way through to Newsroom and then EP Update Registration. Um, another possibility is to follow us on Facebook. Just type in uh, Empowering People Network on Facebook, or to follow us on Twitter. Um, and our Twitter name is um, emp uh, underscore ppl underscore award and I believe that you see that on your screen right now as well. Um, you've been asking about the criteria. Well, as I said, nothing is totally fixed, um, so I can only make rough indications. Um, the criteria will pre presumably be the same as in the first award. You should be able to take part as an individual, as a team, as an organization, or a social enterprise from any region of the world. Um, the product or solution submitted should always um, be already tested and in use. Um, and of course, there's a, a list of criteria um, that the jury will apply. And last time, these were um, uh, five criteria, the potential of the approach in making a contribution to solving, solving basic uh, supply problems, of course, then the technical feasibility, um, the social business concept, um, also with regards to job creation and replicability. Um, the fourth is financial sustainability, and the fifth, um, if, if applicable, um, environmental performance. Um, so another question. Uh, I suggest I just pick out another question about the network, and then I see the questions for the Leverage Freedom Chair and Wanda Glasses are coming in as well, so we'll move to that. Um, I'm supporting a project on household energy solutions in Rwanda. How could the Empowering People Network help me in finding relevant partners for my work? Um, well, it really depends on the kind of partners you're looking for. Um, if you're looking for technical partners or specific product, uh, products, um, for example, in your case, uh, lighting products or cooking solutions for households, then you can just browse uh, through our solutions database that you will find on the Empowering People Network site. Um, you can there, you can filter via the keyword energy, for example, and you'll be able to find several products and organizations that are active in that field. Um, and you'll also find their contact details there so you can get in touch directly. Now, if you're looking for implementing partners um, or financing partners, for example, there are several options that you have as a member of the Empowering People Network. Um, of course, you can be invited to one of the networking events, which I mentioned um, in my presentation um, earlier on. Um, but of course, you're also always welcome to just uh, drop us an email, and, um, and then we'll put you in touch with the relevant partners from our network. Um, so I have a question for the $1 glasses here. Um, and that's regarding the cost structure of your product. If $1 is the, uh, the cost of material, um, 5 to $6 seems like a high margin. Maybe you can say a bit more, Matilde, about how, this, um, how the cost is, uh, is set up. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Caroline. So, um, so one dollar is the cost of the raw material, but uh, you have to add to this uh, the the local taxes on uh, on the material first, which add a little bit, and then and then it's between four and six dollars. It really depends on the country and um, and the, the salary in country. But then it's not really a margin. It's uh, it's the, we're not really, we're absolutely not looking at making profit. So the way the price is established, it's really looking at how much uh, shall we pay the people that produce and sell the glasses. And usually they are actually paid depending on the number of glasses they produce and they sell. And trying to understand how much they can produce and sell per month and give them uh, a decent salary. So, so actually, there is no, I mean. You can call it margin, but there is no profit re really made on this. It's it's the cost of producing and selling the glasses, and then of then buying new raw material to uh, to continue to continue the the project. So um, so we are really paying attention to keeping keep, keeping it as low as possible. And it's important to realize that uh, if you look at all the glasses that are available in country, they are easily for 60, 80, 100. Dollar and they are mostly available only in um, in the capital city. So here we are looking at a device that is really much much cheaper and is available much more uh, easily and widely. Usually also when you when you need a um, pair of glasses, you need to go to the ophthalmologist and then and then go back two weeks after to get the glasses. Here the glasses are ready instantly. So there are a lot of advantages to the system um, that um, I think are great. Uh, above from, from the price itself. Okay. Thank you. I hope uh, the answer at least answered the question. I hope so too. If not, um, maybe just uh, send us a new question uh, into the, the q and A. I I think this was uh, Mr. Reiner. Um, I have another question uh, for you, Mathilde. Um, Samira is uh, are saying, uh, hello, I came in a bit late. I want to ask how the $1 glasses deal with rust, as I guess it is metal. Can you reply to her? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a really good question. Actually, I've never seen, uh, seen rust on, uh, on the glasses, um, on, this, uh, on this stainless steel, the, it seems, but the, the rust, uh, there is no rusting problem. And actually, we, uh, we just had a... A survey in, from our clients done in one of the country, and this was this has never been mentioned as a as a problem that they might have seen in uh, in the glasses. And actually, they were really happy about the product and uh, and its quality and uh, robustness. So, so for the moment, it's not a problem we have to deal with. Okay, thank you. Now we have a question uh, for Tish. Um, have the mobility devices been independently tested and approved by any accredited third-party standards and testing organizations such as ANSI? Yep, so we've put the leverage freedom chair through the resina testing, um, which does a whole bunch of double drum tests and, and weight drops. Um, we did that uh, with a group at the University of Pittsburgh called HURL, the Human Engineering Research Laboratory. Um, and so the, yes, the original design has been through that test and passed. Um, the new design, which we're releasing in the U.S. market, we're going through the testing right now. Um, so we are taking care of all of those. We also have a, a fair number of our own tests that we do internally as well, but it is important to get those third-party standards um, met. Um, and I can, I see there's another question that's come in um, asking if we've thought about designing for local production as local labor usually adds local value. Uh, we completely agree. Um, we've looked at a model where a wheelchair would be built, um, you know, from scratch in all these different countries and the challenge is keeping the cost down. Um, by centralizing the manufacturing, we can reach an economy of scale and, and really bring costs down and get more of these to, to people who need them. Um, now what we've done though is we're pairing our central manufacturing with local assembly. So the wheelchairs are manufactured, the parts are manufactured at our contract manufacturer in India and they're shipped disassembled. And then local labor does the final assembly and then the fitting and, and distribution of the chairs. So it's sort of the, the hybrid model that we've, we've hit upon that, that meets all of our needs. Okay, thank you. 
Um, I see, Mathilde, that uh, Rhino has written back to us. The new raw material to buy is already covered by the $1. Four to $5 profit uh, or salary seems quite a lot in these countries. Um, maybe you can just explain like um, the other costs that are that are related um, to setting up a project and, um, and and how this fits into the into the. Um, yeah, actually, it can it can um, sound much, but it, it's not that much if you want to offer to people a decent salary. It depends also on how many glasses you can produce per day. Um, uh, the average is uh, between uh, 10 and 15 per per day. So maybe that's that's where um, that that's where the, the challenge comes from in terms of number, because uh, it's not like if someone could produce a uh, hundred pair of glasses per day. And depending on the country, also the the production rate really differs. So uh, some people are just able to produce more quickly uh, quality glasses. So if you want to give decent salary. For, for people, knowing that the team is uh, the, the, the producer and the salesperson, and you also have to cover the cost of people who manage the entire team, and uh, and also something I didn't mention, you know, like the the building where they work, they need to, they have a lot of cost actually to cover just to be able to to run the business. So actually, it's not such a huge margin if you consider the number of glasses that are produced and sold per day, and and it's really important for us that um, that. They make a living out of it. Um, we don't want. Uh, I'm not saying they're going to be rich, but uh, we we want to make sure that uh, they can actually provide for their families through these uh, these new businesses. So I I don't think the margin is uh, is extraordinary considering all these goals. I hope it's answered a bit better. Otherwise, right here we can yeah. continue the conversation on a separate yeah, forum. Exactly. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you can get in touch by email. If it's, if uh, there's more um, deep discussions that are needed. I, I think it's important to keep in mind that this is a solution for uh, for a developing country, and that of course, in comparison to other um, in, in comparison to other products that are on the market, the, 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 it's important to keep in mind that the um, that the uh, material costs are just um, just lower than than um, in comparison to the overall price. Um, anyway, I'm sure you can you can um, continue the debate on email. Um, I have another question for you. Um, I support an NGO which runs a program where eyeglasses um, are donated to second to secondary school to secondary school students at Ibadan, southwestern part of Nigeria. Is there any way we could collaborate because the funding is killing? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, let's um, let's uh, let's discuss that. I, I think you you might have seen my my email, or we can we can share it uh, more widely. But uh, yeah, I mean, for the moment we don't have activity in Nigeria, but that's something we can uh, we we can discuss. Try to understand how how we could support you and, and the important work that you are doing. Great. Um, Tish, another question for you. Uh, Maria is writing, um, for the Leverage Freedom Chair, can anyone order a chair in the US? And somebody else has been asking me, how can I buy a Leverage Freedom Chair? So what are the options here? Yes, yeah, so for the, the original product that we're offering um, for developing countries, um, orders go directly through us, through GRIT. <laughs> um, our minimum order quantity outside of India is 20 units. Uh, we generally say it's 100, but I'm happy to work with, with smaller units for any of you. Um, and then for the new Freedom Chair that we've launched in the U.S., you can pre-order it on Kickstarter. We'll start making deliveries between May and July of 2015, but the pre-order on Kickstarter is the best way to lock in the lowest price and get free shipping in the U.S. Um, after starting January 1st uh, in the U.S., um, you'll place orders directly on our website. So I hope that that answers your questions about ordering. But again, feel free to reach out to me directly by email for any other questions related to ordering. Okay, great. So we have five more minutes um, for any questions there might be. Maybe in the attendee list right now, I don't see any questions coming in.
Um, I'll wait for another half minute, and otherwise, maybe I'll just ask questions myself. <laughs> okay. Um, Oh, I do see there are some other questions. Um, does the network provide funding for projects? Um, how can I get funded by the Siemens Stiftung? How can I apply to get sponsored? <laughs> um, I was expecting a question like this. Um, well, it's important to say that um, the Siemens Stiftung is an operative foundation and is therefore unfortunately not able to provide monetary funding as such. Um, our resources are currently committed to medium and long-term uh, projects, and therefore we always have to ask for understanding that we cannot provide um, or fund additional projects. What the Empowering People Network um, provides is also not funding as such. Um, what it can offer are all sorts of uh, other types of support, uh, which, if translated in terms of money, are of um, very high monetary value. Um, these can be, as I explained in my presentation, um, the participation and training sessions, like the Empowering People on sites, the workshops, which bring together um, social entrepreneurs, inventors, international organizations um, to, to network. Um, in terms of financing, what we can also offer is basically to um, assist and advise our network members in the application for funds from different types of donors, such as um, public organizations or grant-giving foundations or also impact investors, for example. I hope that answers um, the question. Um, a few questions from Yuve Guluma. Um, What's the criteria for inclusion in the trainings? For example, do people have to know how to read and write? Um, the second question, the training lasts for about one month. How are you working around time constraints and the work burden? Um, and the rest of the question is uh, cut off, but maybe you can answer that one. Yeah, so, so the first one were the criteria for inclusion in the, in the training. The, um, we, don't, we don't have criteria. We really want to be as inclusive as possible and to, to work on the machine, you don't need to know how to read and write. So um, they are really simple machine and pretty much anybody can, um, can do the glasses. It's a, it, you need to be precise and that's why it takes some time to make them really perfectly. But it's a it's a manual job, so it's uh, you don't need to read and write. So that's that's important. Thanks for asking this question. And the second uh, about the um, the time constraint, I, I guess what you mean is like how do we get people involved for for a month? So um, I think it's also when we start the training, usually we have 30 people uh, to start the production training, and at the end, more or less six people finish the training and actually are able to produce to the quality that we're expecting. And, uh, and depending on the country, in some country the trainees um, come, come to the training uh, because otherwise there is no other option. And in some, some country we actually have to provide salaries to the trainees while they are trained. And that, uh, that is also um, something that needs to be funded through uh, the NGO and the donation that we, we can get for that. So if this was part of your question, in terms, um, in terms of timing, usually you have two sessions. You have uh, two two-week sessions of training, and they are separated by two to three weeks of non-training, where people actually um, do the glasses by themselves, and the frames are checked by, uh, by specialists either in country or in Germany. So I hope this answers your question. And um, I see that there is a precision on your question. Uh, my focus was on the work burden of especially women. Um, do you mean that, uh, that it's just too much, too much time focused on, on the training? I'm not completely sure I, I understand the question. So, I but, uh, but, but you should... Maybe she can specify the, um, the question in an email to you. Um, the emails are mentioned yeah. um, 
here on the slide. I'm just looking at the time, and I think we slowly have to wrap up. Um, so maybe it's, it's probably the most efficient if you, if you get in touch via email about this one. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Well, thank you again uh, to Tish and Mathilde for the very interesting presentations. Uh, thank you also to everybody who attended. I see that uh, a number of questions have come in in the last few minutes, and unfortunately we have not been able to answer all of them. But um, we'll do so via email. So uh, just drop on us, um, a line on the, on the email um, addresses that are indicated uh, on the presentation. Um, finally, again, a big thank you to Engineering for Change for giving us the opportunity to present on here. Um, have a good day, evening, afternoon out there, wherever, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us.